करना ओके ओके गाबी सॉरी बिकॉज वी वी लॉस द कनेक्शन बट फ्रॉम हियर and now we are seeing you and uh, i think that hearing you very well so uh gabby thank you so much and uh you have more or less 10 minutes it's we're going to do all the um presentations uh, one by one and then we will have 15 to 20 minutes to of of uh, general discussion so please gabby go ahead yes Okay, thank you. Then let me share my screen. Oh, you have to able me to. Just a sec, because we have, you have to. Tenis que permitirla, es Sara o? Yeah, you can do it now. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um. Just a moment, because now. Okay, and. Yes. So you can see my screen, right? Yeah. 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 Thank you, Gabi. Okay. It. Uh, I don't know why, but it takes a little bit of time that uh, my computer switches to full presentation mode. Can you still hear me and see my screen? Because I can. Okay. Um. Yeah. Can you see my um uh, screen? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, my name is uh, Gabriela Dossi. I'm a senior researcher at Viable Cities and uh, also a researcher at uh, KTH um, Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. And um, basically, um, the focus of my research is transition management and the creation of the transition arenas. A few words about my, uh, me. So originally, I am a sociologist. But um, I did my PhD uh, in uh, Amsterdam at the Environmental Policy Analysis uh, Department. So, uh, and later on, I also learned a lot of other disciplines. So I would um, say that uh, I, I am very multidisciplinary in terms of my research, but my main theoretical background is the transition theory. And... Um, in my PhD research, I focused on energy communities and I studied their transition potential. But later on, I started to shift to urban transition and um, focusing on transition management specifically within this uh, broader topic. And um, a few words about viable cities. So viable cities is, is a Swedish strategic innovation program, which um, um, basically was uh, set up for 10 years um, to function as a type of development agency with a very specific focus. In a viable cities case, um, it's um, a smart and sustainable cities. And um, viable cities uh, provide uh, both type of support uh, for different type of initiatives. On the one hand, a viable cities... Gabi. Just yeah. sorry, just a sec. Uh, we're not seeing your slides. If you are switching, oh, you are not seeing. Oh. No, I mean we are. We're seeing like the the big one with the small ones uh, to the left. Yeah, not full screen, but. Uh, oh okay, then um, I don't know. <laughs> okay. If yeah, if uh, if um, full screen mode is not working, yeah, okay. we can we can see them like this, and it's okay. So okay. we are we are seeing now the the one of viable cities. Great, thank you. Okay, good. So basically, now you can see that um, um, uh, um, viable cities is supporting um, uh, cities to become climate neutral by twenty thirty. To set this mission, and they uh, viable cities supports them on the one hand financially, but on the other hand, uh, also with expert support, all types of expert support, which is, I think, even more important uh, in this case. And uh, in 2019, our first initiative started um, supporting nine cities to become climate neutral. And then later on, two years later, another 14 cities joined this mission, which we call, which you can see uh, on this map that which are these um, 
cities in Sweden. Um, and basically this model was then adopted by uh, the European Commission when it launched um, the 100 uh, Climate Neutral Cities mission as well. And um, the whole program or the whole model of viable cities is very much based on the transition management uh, theory. In my research, I um, developed a tailored version of the learning history method, which basically uh, tracks learning uh, within cities and across cities and try to map the steps of this transition process. And um, I follow three cities uh, at the same time. And just a few words about transition management. Uh, unfortunately, okay, so there should be some animation here, but <laughs> I can still uh, do it. Um, so basically, um, the main idea behind transition management, and especially when we are focusing on urban transition management, is that um, the traditional way of uh, governance of a municipality, but it can be also any type of organization, is that policy making or planning and the implementation of the plans are done, developed uh, within an organization, within the framework of an organization. However, to tackle such complex uh, challenges as climate change and uh, uh, CO2 reduction, it is very important that, um, that all types of stakeholders in a city um, basically collaborate and, and develop plans how to reduce the emission in the city because stakeholders individually uh, have a very limited impact, but um, together they can strengthen each other. And that's why the main idea be behind transition management is uh, bringing all these stakeholders together from business, academia, public organizations, and also the citizens to develop joint plans and do joint policy making, and then implement these plans together. And uh, this is what we call the network governance. So basically, uh, transition management is about how can we help, as a first step, the cities to leave uh, all the organizations, leave the, this old-fashioned or traditional way of governance behind and join in a network governance when they can vision together and develop plans for um, a, com a complex transformation of the city. In uh, viable cities, as you can see, here is viable cities, um, supports first municipalities to set up a so-called transition team. A transition team is responsible for the coordination and the support uh, of this process. So it, it, it has a, a facilitating and an intermediary role uh, in the process and it's very important. This can be hosted within uh, the municipality, but it can also contain uh, other type of stakeholders. And then this transition team um, has the ambition to set up this um, arena, transition arena, basically the stakeholder collaboration, in, um, inviting um, representatives uh, of um, this quadruple helix actors. And then the arena has the mission to uh, develop what we call um, climate city contract, which is basically an agenda, a transition agenda, how to make a, an overarching plan, how to make the city climate neutral. At the same time, uh, the arena also does experiments and um, which we call system demonstrators, which basically demonstrates in small what kind of complex um, and overarching changes and transformations we need at the city. And when we are talking about uh, these um, changes, it is very important that transition management uh, and, and uh, such uh, complex system transformations requires not only changes at the um, superficial level, only at the practices, but also changes uh, in approaches, how you look at things, how you look at business, leave the business as usual behind and develop new way um, of um, collaborations and, and business and investment. And also at the deepest level, new uh, norms and new values, new understanding and mental models 
uh, how a society should function. And these are very important that uh, at all levels, uh, this transformation um, takes place because otherwise it's very easy to shift back to the business as usual uh, way of doing things, which is not enough in uh, tackling complex system transformations or the challenges. And then um, just a very quick summary about the process of transition management. Um, so originally, transition management uh, was really focusing on the arena. And the arena, as I said, is um, basically a platform collecting or a containing um, quadruple helix uh, stakeholders. They should be um, selected um, after that, how much progressive they think about this topic. So they should be front runners and, and with also some, some uh, political and economic power. And the main idea is that you make this uh, stakeholders sit down and explore and identify the biggest challenge which they want to focus at, then um, do joint visioning about how a sustainable future should look like, then develop transition pathways by backcasting that uh, by imagining this uh, sustainable future, they develop uh, plans like going step by step from the future to the present, then um, experiment that how these pathways can be uh, put into practice. And then at the same time, uh, do monitoring and evaluation all along because learning, as I said, it's a very key uh, part of transition management. However, um, later on, engaging and anchoring and getting into action also got add to the to this process, which is very, very important because um, um, because many transition management experiments in real life stop at this place where they have developed the transition agenda, the pathways, they did some experiments, but the real implementation, uh, of the plans and the real transformation uh, was missing from the process. And still until today, I haven't read any uh, about any experiment which resulted in a complex system transformation, which I think one of the biggest shortcomings of the transition management theory. And finally, uh, my theoretical contribution or like what I've learned and also what viable cities does differently compared to the original theory. Um, on the one hand, we expand the notion of the transition arena in terms of its size. So it's important for us not to involve exclusively just the front runners, uh, a few like 10, 12 front runners, how the theory suggests, because then it lacks the legitimacy uh, of their uh, joint um, uh, visions and, and agendas. And second, we also expand the term of collaboration. In the original um, transition management theory, it is meant only for a short term, like for half a year or even less uh, uh, shorter time. In, in our understanding, the transition arena should exist as long as the transformation is taking place, as long as the um, transition process is taking place, and it has to be renewed constantly, which we use the climate city contract um, for, which is basically a living document, but much more we look at it as a process which contains the transition agenda, but it's not just a one set, a time set document, but it's constantly evolving and um, integrating new aspects. Then another uh, theoretical contribution is the shift uh, of the focus um, uh, of the empowerment because the transition management theory really focuses on the empowerment of uh, the stakeholders included in the arena and how they can be empowered. However, if we want um, the plans to be implemented, it's very important that um, not only the representatives get empowered individually, but also the organizations behind um, the stakeholders to make them commit, to make them uh, engaged and uh, basically anchor them into this process. 
it, it is very important that we empower them as well. And this is basically the third point, point about that um, um, in my research, I'm really focusing on the engaging and anchoring part and the getting into action because this is the weakest spot of the transition management theory. Um, and also, it's very important to explore the success factors of the voluntary collective action because joint visioning is still the easiest step in voluntary collective action. What is very much more challenging is the implementation. And the transition theory and uh, the transition uh, management theory hasn't given proper answers to this question yet. And finally, I also studied the drivers for joining and engaging in stakeholder collaboration because it is one um, thing that uh, the transition team or transition um, practitioners want to develop such an arena for complex systems transformations, but the stakeholders who join and come this arena don't necessarily have the same driver at the beginning. And it is very important to learn that why do organizations send their representatives to the arena? Why do they join? What kind of agenda do they have by joining? Because as long as we don't pay attention to this, they might on the one hand not join. Second, they might not really put effort into this process. So we need to also see their interest in this process and how we can align their interest with um, the mission. So that's it. Thank you. So thank you so much, um, Gabby, um, for your, uh, always for your um, clarity in unpacking such uh, complex uh, concepts and, and, and initiatives. And uh, I would like just to briefly highlight two of, of uh, the ideas that have uh, you have shared with, with us that I think that we we shared and and I would say that uh, uh, they are kind of obsession for, for us and which are um, the importance of, of, of the practice and going beyond pilots and, and, and experimental uh, projects that are needed uh, are a part of, of the whole uh, transition process. But what we would like to see is uh, scale, uh, changes at scale. And uh, I think it's really, really important to highlight this and to recognize that there are not so many examples of this. And, and it's very important to um, to claim and, and to follow uh, the processes that has some chances of, of um, reaching this kind of impacts. And on the other hand, I would like also to, to highlight the anchoring. Uh, yesterday, I uh, we we spoke a little bit about this, the, the importance of uh, the internet internalization of, of the changes uh, in the organizations that are working collect collectively. And uh, I think that we we shared this this huge importance of of anchoring on really um, um, going inside uh, of the organizations and and changing the organizations uh, by themselves, which is very important to to reach uh, really um, impactful uh, collaborations. So we are going to move forward uh, to Valerie. Uh, Valerie Puello, uh, she is a um, professor at the Université uh, Lyon University in France. Um, we are very happy to have a, a neighbor here. Uh, and um, they have uh, developed a really interesting uh, initiative, uh, a, labor a laboratory called EMU, uh, um, World um, uh, Urban World Intelligences Laboratory, uh, Labo Laboratoire d'Intelligence de Monde Urbain. Um, so she's also a project manager there, and she's going to to share with us some of, of their uh, main insights in, in the last, uh, let's say, five or six years of work, right? So thank you so much, Valérie, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jaime. Oh. No, no, please. I'm old, you know. 
Thank you for, for this uh, invitation, for this meeting. Uh, as you noticed yesterday, my English language is not very bad, not very good, so I'm going to read. It will be better for me and for you, I hope. So I'm Valérie Puyo, research on inner ergonomics, uh, specialized in the design of uh, complex processes, realized to face challenges due to Anthropocene, and I am in charge of the prospective mission in our, uh, in our laboratory, Urban World Intelligence, with my colleagues here, uh, Laura Bertrand, project manager, and Véronique Tessier, partnership research and innovation project manager and urban planner. Uh, the lab is a French research and experimentation institution uh, working on generalized uh, urban worlds. It brings together uh, 37 research uh, teams on the Lyon Saint Etienne site, uh, 19 higher education and research organizations, and a lot of uh, institutional and private partners. Our aim is to produce the conditions for collective resolution of social, political, technical, environmental, and climatic changes, challenges in uh, two connected directions. On one hand, changes uh, caused by urban worlds, and uh, on the other one, the prism of urban world, through the prism of urban worlds. These uh, two ways are explored via scientific and technical plurality. And the project is about exploring ex exper experimenting transitions and bifurcations to be made in the territories. The challenge is to reimagine desirable and possible futures, and uh, that uh, is why Urban Worlds is an innovative, forward-looking, and transformating research tool which aims to develop uh, holistic and systemic approaches and methods with and for partnership partners and public, ranging from the statement of problems to their resolution based on pragmatism of Dewey's philosophy. And our position is to make in order to understand, in order to transform. Um, in this orientation, uh, our lab developed a studio, Sustainable Metropolis in Transition, Work, Health and Prospective, which brings together researchers and practitioners in a collaborative setting. The studio functions as an incubator and its position is as follows. Uh, facing the challenges of Anthropocene and designing a sustainable metropolis, which is a living environment, requires making technical, urban, uh, agroecological, industrial, and institu institutional uh, transition. And these transitions are based on transition in the work regime and activities, which are called professional transitions. This professional transition must be placed in the core of the innovative and complex projects carried out. This requires revising the way of carrying out the projects, including their objects, stages, parameters, and the conventions between actors. The objective, our objective is to co-produce action guidelines to support both transitions in complex projects to uh, design desirable living and working environments with and for the protagonist in the territories and uh, at the territorial scale. In the studio, in terms of uh, methods, this objective is addressed among others by providing feedback on uh, design projects carried out on different configurations, uh, different uh, functional spheres, uh, different uh, scales, and the shared analysis grid examines what is design, project structures, values, desirable, temporalities, specialities, and so on and so forth. Uh, is also uh, addressed among others by uh, uh, engaging, exchanging on the rationality of action, health, project criteria, and at least by participating in complex projects in various sectors. Uh, at this moment, we have uh, research uh, in temporary urban planning, for example, and the team aims to bring out the project's perspective. Uh, uh, the team aims to act on the project and in the project and to produce ref relevant references for the action. The general method is uh, an inductive approach, a qualitative approach developed within the framework of design ergonomics, 
with, which includes uh, work analysis, uh, simulations, analysis of reference situations, uh, self-confrontation interviews, um, and uh, the all forms a dialogical and developmental approach. Time is okay? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you can read on the slide some uh, disciplines and references. The list is not exhaustive, it, but uh, the time is very constant, so I'm going to uh, to let this uh, this comment. But we can exchange, of course, if you if you want after. And uh, um, our position, uh, our team assumes the difference between um, proposed uh, by a student mayor between invasion, innovation, and uh, uh, development design process. In this way, the design process development can be described as a final, finalized process, time constrained, and involving a diversity of factors, uh, questioning the more or less favorable collective dynamic at work, starting from an initial uh, intention, a project perspective, what organization of the collective action is implemented, what are the stages, the approaches and methods uh, mobilized to deploy a novelty locally, what rationality of action on the, on the participative plan, constant openness, co-construction, uh, around what and how. For us to address these questions, it's necessary to give a central place to work, and uh, uh, to activity, particularly in, in, in innovative design. When the design is established, the performance criteria are known, the success criteria are stabilized, the expertise is well identified, and the procedure are tested. The actors learn to face the singularity by exploiting uh, available resources within a stable framework. However, in a innovative design, the framework is called into question because it has become unsuitable. New criteria for success must be developed along with new tangible and intangible resources and new expertise that are well adapted for, to the needs or constraints encountered. However, in design processes and in Anthropocene, work uh, that's to save a productive regime and the experience of concrete activity by actors are often overlooked. Nevertheless, work is also a perspective and it can be unlocked uh, unlock in this project and uh, work activity is also a resource that actors have and their experience sh should be relied on. Professional transitions in these innovative projects involve involve uh, the joint reconfigur reconfiguration of activity and working regime regimes. These transitions are trajectories and their outcome are uncertain for the protagonists who experience them. And for us to succeed in complex, uh, in complex transition projects, a dialectical tension between the desirable, the political project on one hand, and the possible in connection with the expression in the materiality must be created and both must fertilize each other through by work and activity. Now I'm going to uh, illustrate this uh, proposal with a short case. Um, the case study is a pilot project called Smart, Smart Electric Lyon. <laughs> which participated in research on smart cities. This project led by the French energy producer aimed to improve energy efficiency project by offering a new commercial uh, service, a new tariff, through the installation of smart meters in the homes of, uh, of residents and business or communities. The meter allows the distributor implement load sharing uh, to control energy consumption. The project started, uh, started criteria were saving for customers, control of flow and production for energy producers and less pressure on the environment. The project assumed that energy could be regulated via, via the load shedding method. More precisely, the hypothesis of the project was that by reducing energy consumption program during period of great cold, it could generate significant reductions in local power consumption and provide the flexibility to the grid during peak consumption. I would like to make two short remarks. The first one, it, it was a technocentric approach, a design process for which they already have the solution, uh, a matter and a tariff. Uh, 
Second remark, we can say uh, it was a diffusionist technology transfer without real prior association of professional, uh, whether in the design of the matter or in the rest of the project uh, of the design process, we will further see, and without integration of the work that this requires of uh, what it changes of the desirable of the professionals and possibilities. We see that our collaboration partnership with the project manager mm -hmm. allowed us to act on the design process and within the design process, the manager was in charge of the business to business part of the project. Uh, so, so acting um, on the project with and for actors. Initially, the design process was thought on, thought of in a demonstrator mode, which uh, involved installing the matter on the site, setting up a measurement device, load shedding tests, and evaluating saving for customers and distributors, and adjusting the tariff. So there was again no partnership with professionals and installers, and so on and so forth. But the professionals were unable to install the matters and to ensure the interconnection between the devices, which have different uh, functions and languages, and to set up the measurement. And the professional of the site had other desirable issues and problems to resolve related to the building, to uses, to interoperability, to a broad approach to energy efficiency. Therefore, it was necessary to aim for mastering the energy demand, MDE, for sites, integrating various criteria. To do so, it was necessary to bring together all the professionals to deal with a complex subject, the MDE, it is the new, and it was the new desirable chaired with criteria. All professionals and professional worlds acted together, forming a common world uh, and seeing their practices change. <laughs> the energy specialists. I, the energy specialists learn about the machines, the maintenance people about building issues and so on and so forth. This required restructuring the design process from demonstrator to a dialogical and developmental approach, linking global projects and side projects by experimenting step by step with iteration and reflexing points. Acting in the project. To support the new aim around MDE, it was necessary to design organization, conventions, knowledge, practices, allowing for collective active management. In terms of methods, we established a work observatory with partners to examine the locks during exper experiments via, via observation, structure, debriefs, and narration on the scenario, then their achievement during experiments, and also to put in heritage and crystallize organizations, de uh, decision, and so on and so forth. So contrary to what could be considered at the beginning of the project, the new practices resulted in profound transformation for all actors, which took place at two levels. The first referred to the transformation of the professional worlds of actors. The second, related to the first one, concerns the necessary coordination or collective actions to ensure the progress of experiments. You want to? Do you want to? I stop. No, no. It's no, possible. No. I can. <laughs> uh, I'm going to conclude um, briefly. <laughs> This research has provided insights on the rationality of action and proposed methods for implementing innovative projects that articulate transitions and uh, professional changes. For successful uh, transition, um, it's important to consider the following points. Work and activity are structuring. Professional transitions are shared and resolved around a common object facilitated by a common world. And that is an, or an orchestration between different professional worlds. Partnership and participation are based on concrete exploratory elements on shared interests. Uh, there should be a possible shift between the desirable and the feasible. Reflexivity and action require ad hoc intermedi intermediary times and enterotopia and uh, object. And in concrete terms, this research has enabled uh, the design of a new service, a new contra contractualization between actors, and uh, a new profession, and the emergence of a new profession. And 
we are very interested to be here because we need some uh, responses and feedback to uh, dialogue around uh, institutional uh, dimension, uh, new agreements, cooperations, rule, but also uh, action at uh, the territorial scales. And at least uh, we are very uh, interested to discuss around uh, alternative initiatives and utopias. We are working uh, on this focus now. Thank you so much and sorry for the time. Thank you so much, uh, Valérie. Uh, it's been really, really uh, inspiring um, again, contribution. And um, at least I think that for for the people uh, from ITD, I think that we are uh, we heard a lot of. Uh, very, very familiar um, approaches, and for example, uh, the dialogical approaches that we we work a lot with. Um, this uh, notion of of the desire the, in Ethiopia is it's it's very important in in our work. So uh, I think that we shared a, a lot of of, of uh, approaches, and we have a lot of in, in common. Also, the importance and and we highlighted yesterday. The importance of of uh, capacity building with uh, not only with communities or with uh, but also and mainly with with professional and and uh, people at the decision making levels and as you mm, frame it uh, mm, professional transitions I think that is very very relevant and um, and and it's uh, very nice to. To hear how, how we are building also from from what we heard uh, yesterday and uh, i would like just to to highlight uh, finally uh something that um, i've liked a lot and is this uh, idea and this approach of making for understanding and for transforming i think that is very very uh, nice framing and that something that maybe we all share in in this room so uh we are going to um, uh, to continue with uh, with the panelists, you highlighted also something, uh, the coordination, and uh, I think that now we are going to hear uh, more about this, but not, not only, let's say, coordination in a classical way, but how to really provide uh, direct, direct, directionality and uh, alignment and purpose to a very big set of different stakeholders. So our next panelist is uh, our colleague Miguel Soberon. Uh, he is our ex executive director here at ITD, uh, and um, he's an, an expert in the both uh, multi-stakeholder collaboration in a theory and a practical uh, uh, way. Uh, and uh, he's um, leading also, I think that very important contributions from, from here in the field of, of intermediation. And we're going to, to hear from, from him. So thank you so much, Miguel, and the floor is yours. Well, I, I forgot it, sorry, but I forgot to say that he's uh, a doctoral researcher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Jaime. Thank you, thank you very much. So in this uh, brief session, I'm gonna talk about the, how to cultivate more effective ecologies of intermediation that if you haven't heard about them, it's not normal, <laughs> but you will learn about them very soon. Uh, as Jaime said, uh, oh, here, sorry. As Jaime said, I'm a PhD student here at, the, at UPM. My research focuses on transition intermediaries. Why transition intermediaries? Because I believe there is a big gap between the aspirations that we have in agendas like the Agenda 2030 Agenda, the SDGs, and the real action that we are uh, provoking in the end. So I wanted to see how can we match uh, this need of uh, big transformation uh, with an action, uh, more like more systemic action and not that much of uh, incremental action. And I found in the, the field of transition intermediaries, uh, a way of working towards this uh, systemic action. So since these sessions are more about partnerships, uh, I would like to make a proposal to the audience and to, to try to search for like uh, connections, similarities, and also differences 
between uh, partnerships or partnership facilitation and what I will explain about transition intermediaries. So, <clears throat> yeah. So what is the framework that I'm uh, using? It's like uh, Gabriela said, also in the transition theory, uh, but this time I'm focusing more on the multi-level perspective, which is a very well-known framework. And I'm not gonna get uh, into the detail and uh, probably transition theorists will kill me for what I'm gonna say, but <laughs> in, a, in a nutshell, it's like a power uh, relation between the dominant uh, practices uh, the dominant technologies, the dominant policies. Let's say, for example, uh, we have uh, um, uh, all the dominant practices, technologies, and policies based on having fossil fuels as uh, fossil fuels as uh, main uh, energy source for our living. No, with the future practices, with the future technologies, with the future uh, policies that are like the what they say the the niches. Uh, let's say like basic uh based in our like uh, economy in more religious um renewable energy and so on so there is these tensions between the regime dominant practices and the niches that along the the time there will be like interaction where the the future practices start becoming the the dominant practices no and that's uh the main focus of, on how do we want or how uh, transitions are produced no? so as you can guess in all those uh, interactions there is like a lot of also interactions between actors networks uh, uh influences between all of them and so on and there is a specific actor that caught my attention that are the transition intermediaries uh they are actors that they positively influence the transitions uh, through collaboration, through building a new collaboration between uh, stakeholders, partners, network, networks, and so on. And they can be individuals, they can be organizations, or they can be also platforms of collaboration or, or partnerships. So uh, there are different types of uh, transition intermediaries, and there are different types of how do they apply their intermediation. So I brought just one like a diagram where the intermediary is like the black box in the middle normally, and the 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 other symbols are uh, stakeholders, let's say. So here they uh, and uh, they represent different types of uh, uh, intermediation and adding complexity for each level. No, so the first uh, the first level would be like intermediation between some organizations, a couple of organizations. Second level would be intermediation between a network of entities, organizations. The third level would be intermediation between different networks from different sectors or different areas. And uh, the third level would be uh, intermediation between different networks and the institutions. Here we could refer institutions as, as those like the dominant practices we were talking about. No? So it's intermediation between the different networks that occur at the niche level and also uh, the, the, the regime level. No? So, <clears throat> uh, but what I wanted to like, let's say the research is very focused on what the intermediaries do, what roles do they play, what activities they deploy for, especially for the stakeholders. No? And what we thought uh, here at ITD together was that we wanted not just to focus on the relations between intermediaries and their stakeholders, but between the intermediaries with each other. In, uh, in what we, or what uh, the literature is called as uh, ecologies of intermediation. So what differentiates ecologies from uh, the work of intermediation is that ecologies focuses on the relations, the tensions, the complementarity between the different intermediaries that each intermediary has their own stakeholders uh, with them, right? So when we start looking at the, at the literature, we saw that actually between intermediaries, uh, it's very uh, paradoxical, I would say, because intermediaries promote collaboration. They are they they add value is based on collaboration, but between them, there's a big competition for financial resources, for attention of the stakeholders. Uh, <laughs> there is also there are also problems of adaptation of intermediaries when the when the context or the transition evolves because the the services they offer to the stakeholders uh, need to change as the transition changes. And and when you see like the full, let's say, or, 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 or big parts of the ecology, you see also that there are gaps 
in intermediation and overlaps between different intermediaries. So what we, um, our question, this was not the exact research question, but it was like, how can we make this more efficient or how can an intermediary work for the intermediaries? <laughs> uh, so we had a case here in ITD, uh, which, is, which was the base of our like uh, empirical work. Uh, where in a platform called El Dia Después, uh, we put together uh, 38 intermediary organizations, 41 actors, a networks institution, and we uh, facilitated the, that ecosystem just to make the, that ecology more effective. We were not providing services directly to uh, final users, to specific stakeholders. We were working to make the ecology uh, more coordinated, more aligned, and so on. So in one year and a half that lasted the, the research, we organized 27 events and workshops, and uh, we had more than 1,000 uh, professionals, experts, participants in our, in our workshop. Uh, like, I, I, I can't uh, talk about all the results we had, but I just uh, wanted to summarize some of the add value of this initiative, or what was more, uh, valuable for the, for the intermediaries and the stakeholders was that we built uh, new opportunities of collaboration between intermediaries that they knew each other, that they were in the system, but they didn't know that they could collaborate you know, and they could benefit from that collaboration. We amplified the impact uh, because of the coordination. We, we got more like a coalitions of, 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 of um, of organizations and intermediaries that bring their organizations in. But especially I would uh, uh, I would highlight something that yesterday was uh, on the conversation, which is like what we created for me and for and also like what the results were is that uh, we created a common sense of, uh, of, uh, of community. We built affection, we built trust between the people, between the organizations organizations and we build trust and uh, between individuals that are representing those organizations so uh, through these events they don't just uh, focus on how to make their business bigger uh, but they also had fun with others <laughs> they created uh, trustful relationships and that was very very important to to manage some conflicts because conflicts will come in many situations, intermediaries are competitors. So, but it was much easier to address it when they had some bonds between them already. So that was one of the most, let's say, powerful uh, results we found on the uh, through this case study. And as a contribution to the research, uh, we add, let's say, one more level to the to the to the system levels that I saw before. We call it a uh, system level for yeah. ecology intermediation, emphasizing that attention to, to the full ecology and not just to your intermediation with your stakeholders. Um, and well, we started to characterize that uh, type of intermediation, which would be based more in non-instrumental relations, not relations, not building relations to a specific end, but it's an iterative process where uh, the results will come, but you're focusing on the more like the, the qualitative, let's say, or the quality of the relations. Um, and well, there, there are a lot of learnings that I don't think I have time to, to share, but uh, putting like, for us, it was a very good experience to being able to contribute to the theory based on the practice we were doing on our daily basis, because normally we were like, learning from theory and trying to apply it to the practice, but it was kind of the other way around and it was a, a good experience for us. And just as some questions for the debate later, I wanted to ask you if, uh, how does this transition intermediaries or what I uh, talked about relates to partnerships or the facilitation of partnerships? Uh, also, is there now like literature on partnerships that also focus on the relation between partnership and not just the partners, like the, 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 the stakeholders of the partners? So that would give us uh, another like perspective. And also something that we <laughs> talk a lot about it here in uh, ITD is how can we measure better uh, very important aspects of uh, intermediation such as building trust. How do we measure trust? How can we make it more tangible? How can we make uh, also like uh, creating uh, 
creative uh, uh, atmospheres for more effective collaboration. For us, it's very difficult to measure those like very intangible things. <clears throat> and well, if anybody has ideas, <laughs> they are very, very welcome. So this is uh, it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miguel, so much for introducing, uh, at least in my opinion, this very important uh, notion and, and very important for, for our future. Um, um, we will uh, have the time to, um, if, if we want, to provide some answers or, or some reflections around these questions, but I would like to uh, just to point out that um, at least in, in our experience um, and, and as you mentioned partnerships can be like we were thinking about how can we cultivate these ecologies so partnerships can be like the farmers of these of these, uh, of these uh, ecologies and um, and I think it's very interesting uh, what Lida highlighted yesterday about the more uh, relational and process-oriented um, dimensions of, of partnerships, which I think that are very, very uh, related to, to what you have uh, shared with us. And uh, I would like to say that uh, these um, ecologies of uh, intermediation, I think that it's uh, an emergent model and I guess that we are going to see it uh, more and more in the future. And uh, maybe we, we can discuss, but um, I think that we can say that, for example, Viable Cities, uh, the initiative that uh, Gabriela uh, described uh, before, could be also um, conceptualized as an ecology of intermediation because uh, they are trying to uh, behave like this farmer uh, nurturing other uh, intermediaries that are the Swedish cities that are committed with climate neutrality in 2030. So uh, I think that's a very promising model. And um, I hope that we can also provide uh, more insights uh, jointly. So thank you so much for, for uh, introducing it. And um, we're going to continue with, with our session with uh, Bruna. Bruna Singh, she's a doctoral researcher at FAO. Uh, she's uh, from Brazil. And um, we're going to uh, explore now more the um, business, uh, supply chains, human rights uh, field. So uh, Bruna, thank you so much. And the floor is yours. We have your presentation here. So you have just to use this. Um, yeah. So thank you so much. Hi. Uh, well, it's a small mistake here of typing, but you know, please. Uh, well, my name is Bruna. Um, just very fast about myself. I oh sorry, yeah, wrong computer. <laughs> I did my I'm a lawyer, so you're going to hear a little bit more. I try to translate more known law language in the presentation. I'm a lawyer. I did my master in UK in Glasgow with the Chivini scholarship. Uh, was in political science, and now I'm doing my doctoral at FIU uh, with my colleagues here in the doctoral program on business human rights, which is founded by the Little Network of Bavaria. I have experience in NGOs. Um, I also have experience with the state institutions. I work with, <coughs> sorry, I work with refugees already. I had work with domestic violence case, and my most recent work before going to the PhD was with the business and human rights consultancy. So I think I, I passed from most of the areas that I could work before, and was based on my experience on my uh, business and human rights in the business and human rights consultancy that I developed a lot of questions, especially about leverage. So. Yeah, but no. Okay, so um, about I, I question about leverage and leverage is based on what my research is. 
This presentation is not uh, my PhD research because I recognize that as a law research, thank you, um, would be very boring for you, just uh, on law and leverage. So I'm going to present a little bit about how you can use leverage, which is a lo lot about my professional experience. Um, First, I would ask, could you raise your hand if you never heard it or if you never heard it before about business human rights agenda or UN guiding principles? Could you raise um, your hand if you never heard it before about UN guiding principles on business and human rights or the business human rights agenda? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. I just hope my doctoral. Colleagues don't raise their hands now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, so for those who doesn't know, um, it's an agenda that has been developed for a long time. Um, and we started with a lot of denounces on human rights impact of companies. Um, in 2008, of course, uh, you in 2000, the mm -hmm. UN um, Global Compact started a lot of debates about how companies, they don't impact only the environment, but the environment that they're inserted. So how they impact communities, individuals that are around. In 2008, the UN um, nominee, the special reporter, um, John Ruggie, to develop a framework on protecting, um, re respect and remedy. Uh, this framework started to uh, be implemented, and in 2011, we have the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And what is it? Um, just another um, explanation. Um, the, we are talking about business and human rights in a way that it's not only the human rights that impact uh, like the, labor, uh, the workforce of the company, but where the company is inserted. So if you have a supply chain, you are ha the company has responsibility by the impact of the supply chain. Ah, okay. So just um, to highlight the importance of the guiding principle, it has been empowering a lot of legislations. And the European Union now is developing another law that will be mandatory for companies that they need to do a diligence process, um, making companies to respect human rights. And what is it? So UN guiding principles based on three pillars. The first one is the state. So the state have the duty to protect human rights, uh, to protect the individuals and communities against the abuses and negative impacts of companies. We have the business, which has the responsibility to respect the human rights by doing due diligence process, uh, showing that they're respecting human rights, uh, doing this process, risk assessment, and many other activities. And both state and... Oh. <laughs> <Okay>. Yeah, <laughs> better. No? Okay, both state and business, they have the responsibility to provide remedy. When we are talking about the business, we have different ways that they can impact human rights. Oh, it's an animation, so you may need to click a lot now. Uh, so the first one, um, <laughs> more. Um, we have like the appropriate measures according to the um, impact the companies are linked. Let's see. The company first can be caused in human rights. So if you have a company with discriminatory con contract uh, um, skills or they don't contract black people, for instance, the company is causing the human rights violation. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, it worked now? Okay. Um, yeah. The company can also contribute with the human rights impact when the company and influence a partner or another supplier, for instance, to impact human rights. So for instance, we have a company that 
contract a security private security company and it says to the private security company to be violent against human rights defenders this is very common so in this case the company is also contributing to the human rights impact and this is difficult for some people to understand because it's complex um, how company can also be linked with the human rights impact be, uh, not causing not contributing but if a company has an indirect supplier, or for instance, think on Unilever, and Unilever buys uh, cacao from a commodity trader, the commodity trader buy from farmer, and the farmer contract a security company that commit violence. Mm -hmm. What is the responsibility of Unilever? Unilever is directly linked with this human rights impact. When the company is causing the human rights impact, they need to seize, prevent, and have some remediations also when they're contributing. And similar to the contribution uh, and direct link, the company used to, need to use leverage. And this is um, important because when you, they construct the UN guiding principles, it's what's not based on legal researchers, but based on a, a lot of partnership between business companies, NGOs, uh, scholars, and consequently, a lot of what we see in UN Guiding Principles is not a legal language. Leverage came from the business language. In business, we use, um, if you want to do investment, investment going to do investment, very connected with investment. But this is not the same meaning that we have for the UN Guiding Principle. So leverage for the UN Guiding Principle is the ability to change a wrongful practice. So you influence by doing activities, the other suppliers to correct this or mitigate this human rights impact that's happening. And there are many ways that you can use leverage. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not only one. You have to, the company can use the framework agreements between company and supply chain. They can map it the value chain, but they also can use multi-stakeholders partnerships, which is also a way that you can use your leverage. And in this sense, I, I work at a lot using documents from the um, Global Business Initiative. So they have a very good material on multi-stakeholder partnership and how they can use, can be a tool for, uh, of using leverage. Um, and I can give some examples on how sometimes organizations and companies, they do wrong. Um, so first of all, like when you are doing um, multi-stakeholder partnerships um, in the context to use as a leverage to correct or mitigate or prevent human rights impact of your indirect suppliers, partners, uh, which you have a direct link. That's like the first thing is that the partnership can have different formats. So you can um, talk with organizations, the government and business to create like a new standard. And here I can see the example of the voluntary principles on security and human rights, which companies and organizations, they talk and they have uh, uh, trainings um, in a way that in the end, um, they have a standard and how companies, especially private companies, Private security comes, they have to follow this standard on security. You can also create a forum for dialogue and learning. Uh, I can show an example later about the Cacao Forum that you have a specific problem on like human rights impacts related to Cacao. And then you create this forum, you ask for also the organizations to participate and create like what are the problems and you listen and create together a new standard, a new practice that can respect human rights. Um, also, stakeholders, they need to have a clear focus uh, and try to understand of same issues and problems. When I work in, in some specific case and like right, I, very fast, <laughs> um, human rights case, um, many times when you're talking with uh, stakeholders, um, especially in, high human rights risk, sometimes they have so many things happening, they don't know exactly what they want to work. So if you're talking with a community about problem and issue, um, an issue related to 
um, water. When you're talking of community organization, they're also going to bring problems related to education, uh, to many other things that are also happening and making their vulnerability worse. And for if you want to like track one problem, you have like to have in mind and have a clear focus what you're doing there in this partnership. Oh, wrong computer. Also, uh, you have to reach out to stakeholders early for friendly and have commitment. Um, and we talked a lot about it yesterday about trust. Um, in many cases, I work at a uh, Organizations told me that they tried partnership with companies for track or solver in shoe, but the companies they didn't appear or they appear with strong lawyers that like scare people. <laughs> yeah, they scare a lot of people and then people like are afraid, or the company came just with like a very general talk and they don't answer anything more. So they gave up about doing any kind of partnership because it don't work. Like, so they started to refuse and they just don't do some uh, partnership only with organizations against the companies. Um, you also have to engage with the right stakeholders. Like many companies, sometimes when they have to engage, they engage with other conservative company that don't represent local communities, for instance. And then you don't have the voice of the people uh, and neither the participation of the impact community, neither the correct answer to mitigate the human rights impact. Um, the effort should be designed collaboratively and sometimes you need to use the state because some, in many times the state will help you to engage and to, and to generate impact. Now, just going to mention this example because I don't have more time. But there is an example of Natura and Co. Natura uh, Cosmetics is one of the biggest commerce industries in the world, and it's a Brazilian one, one of these four brands here. Uh, it's a sustainable company, and they do a lot of partnership with um, communities. And when it comes to conservative indigenous, um, they do a partnership with the platform Origin Brazil, which makes um, traineeships and many other activities um, like to support the negotiation um, with areas that can be conservative and not explore and not um, cause the human rights impact that many companies, they don't have this platform or this third agent they have. And the other is the cacao, um, 2030, which is promoted by international law organization and labor organization and global compact. Uh, and many stakeholders appear. In one of the most interesting things at uh, the organization Comissão Pastoral da Terra, which is a very critical organization in Brazil, they also participate. Um, so you have like many stakeholders to create a new standard, a new forum of discussion, and many voices are here. So yeah, guys. So thank you, <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, Bruna, for also providing to the conversation a very complementary angle, and uh, and I think that um, reflections that connect with with some um, some ideas that, uh, for example, we heard yesterday. Uh, I would like to highlight the um, the role of the state that you mentioned. And I think that yesterday we we also heard from from Javier and from Lida uh, the importance of of uh, of having public authorities uh, sometimes in as a as an active agent in in multi stakeholder partnerships. Uh, what uh, some scholars or practitioners call uh, also problem owners, and uh, as Javier mentioned yesterday, um, public authorities can be sometimes uncomfortable partners <laughs> but uh, i think that uh, as you mentioned they are really important ones so uh, thanks for uh, um, reinforcing this uh, this idea i would like also to highlight the 
importance other uh, other idea that you brought the importance of of scale as as we um talked in the first um uh presentation as uh, and, and i think that working with this huge supply chains it's really important to address this uh this uh, issue of really trying to to deliver transformation at at scale and um also i would like to highlight that uh this context of of um trying to align um very diverse stakeholders in in these supply chains as uh, cacao uh could be um also um um interesting context for for explore the notion that miguel presented the ecologies of intermediation because i think that uh, uh maybe we have to reinforce more and more the intermediaries and uh, and bring them together and i guess that maybe in this field of really trying to align a lot of different businesses uh, civil society organizations uh, public authorities from different countries as well this notion can be also of, of potential interest so uh we're going to um, to continue with the session we have uh two more panelists uh and we're going to continue with nelson nelson okello or okillo okello yeah <laughs> um he is a um, doctor researcher at, at FAO, also at the um uh, international doctor program of business and human rights and he's going to uh, share with us some insights about ICT partnerships in Africa, legitimacy, and the way forward. So thank you so much. The floor is yours. And uh, I hope that the pointer is going to work. But if it's not working, we will. So thank you. Good. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I'm glad that uh, you almost done with the the first slide on uh, about the presenter. I think uh, it's just important to uh, mention that uh, I have a, a law background myself, just like uh, Bruna, and uh, um, I'm, uh, uh, specifically the reason why I'm making this presentation is my interest about uh, coloniality of data and uh, the whole politics of digital rulemaking. Uh, that is very important for me, and you will and you will understand that in 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 a while. Uh, okay, uh, is it not working now? Okay. Uh, okay, so um, I will start off with an uh, explanation of a case study, but before that, perhaps you want to understand that digital transformation as a phenomenon is as is taking place in Africa as a continent. And so far, Africa has developed a digital transformation agenda, and if you look at that agenda, there is uh, uh, of course, commitment of member states to adopt e-governance, e-agriculture, e-health, e-education, uh, uh, digital ID, and all other related um, <clears throat> activities and initiatives. And as because of historical reasons, um, the whole digi digital ecosystem in Africa is dominated by multinationals. This is very historical, and you'll understand because of issues of innovation and where they emanated from and the whole history of colonialism. It is, uh, it is, uh, this, that, that is the phenomenon of, of uh, dominance by the multinationals. There are also a lot of other factors informing the context, but an, another factor is about the fact that uh, the, the globalization has caused, you know, a lot of um, transfer of data across continents, and so even as Africa as a continent, it can't be alone. Uh, this uh, a, uh, a picture I'd placed that shows Africa as being interconnected with all uh, these other continents. And so <clears throat> there are a lot of th these uh, multinationals, uh, there are a lot of them. I randomly chose uh, Huawei 
Uh, so the choice was not based on any methodology because if I chose Microsoft, we could still have a uh, similar, uh, and so I have, it's not an issue of bias. Um, a lot of them, we have Starlink, uh, Microsoft, and some of them have, you know, uh, I mean, there are some multinationals from uh, Abu Dhabi, for example, that are focused in North Africa. Some are, are cross board, but for the purposes of today's presentation, I talk about Huawei. So Huawei is uh, the, the partnerships that it is having in, in Kenya, because as you see the statistics uh, that are down there, the, the digital access, in Kenya as a, as a country in the East African, in, as an East African country, the statistics show that so many people don't have access to internet. And of course the country as a, as a state in the international scene has an obligation to ensure uh, that people have access because the right to, to have access to internet is now being widely recognized as a human right. So there's a partnership with the uh, UNDP, with the state, with the private sector in the banks and the telecoms and the uh, and the SMEs and also they are rolling out some programs to ensure that uh, people in the in, in the villages are able to have um, access to you know internet and one one example I've give, given is on the rural link for for individuals and then for uh, governments they were uh, they have rolled out a pilot project for digital uh, school it's a pilot project so it is they come they partner with government and then they say we want to help the government achieve this objective and we come with this expertise and this is the state of the art very good because of two things one to ensure this digital access and then to bridge the digital uh, divide that is existing uh, so if you move to uh, the second slide, and here I just demonstrate some of the challenges. And perhaps I will allow me to start with the last challenge about conceptualizing what development is in Africa. There, there has been, um, um, when you see the partnership with the UNDP, and you know what the UNDP, uh, you could imagine, uh, does at the, the UN level, it is talking about, okay, so the reason why we are ensuring uh, digital access, it is a means to an end, and the end is economic development, right? If you look at the, the transformation agenda, it really talks about development as the ultimate end. And so there, there has been an issue about what is it, what, what do you mention as development in, a, in an African context? What is development? Because then do we talk about strictly economic development or are there other aspects of development that have also to be considered in these partnerships? I'll explain that as I, I'll be winding up in a while. There have also been challenges that even as, uh, as Huawei uh, collaborates with this um, and gets into these strategic partnerships, there have been issues about uh, surveillance uh, problems that, okay, so the systems and the technologies that are, are being used you know, as part of uh, either the objectives or the outputs of these partnerships can lead to a lot of violations of human rights. And one of them is uh, uh, privacy, you know, People can't pick it because uh, there is a technology that was uh, put there by Huawei to track people. And so the government is able to see, okay, I think it is so-and-so that was uh, on the street and uh, was um, picketing or demonstrating against the government. So those are, are, are really, really serious issues. And I think another issue um, that I would also uh, like to bring up is about where do the partners come from? Because where a partner comes from really informs the it, it it really informs the approach that they give especially to the protection of human rights if uh, because we know that especially in the digital world uh, there the, the us has its own different approach the U, europe has a, a slightly different approach same as uh, uh, China, Russia, and even in different African states so if uh, when you look at uh, as uh, uh, i mean a uh, an entity that is coming to do um, uh, to enter into these partnerships, one thing is that they are much more likely to adopt their approach from their home country, and that also has um, uh, link linkages to uh, possible human rights um, uh, violations. I will not uh, go so much deep into this, but, but serve as just to explain 
just what I've mentioned about the digital uh, transformation and the whole issue of partnerships. I think I've just explained that uh, in my overview. And I will also not spend so much time on these objectives, save as to bring you to the discipline and the much, uh, the bigger issue that I wanted to highlight is a principle or it is, um, should I call it a philosophy or a concept of data justice? Data justice, uh, just like other, uh, other, you can compare them like environmental climate justice, recognizes that the people have certain historical uh, uh, issues of discrimination, for example, and uh, or of or subjugation. And so, when you are rolling out emerging technologies, either as objectives or the output of partnerships, you have to consider that these technologies or the output of the partnership is likely to even worsen an already existing situation. So it, it with this data justice, the presumption is that the emerging technologies that, uh, that come as a result of these partnerships are going to worsen the already bad situation in terms of human rights that these people already have. So if you look at the African data uh, 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 policy that was developed, this principle has been recognized. And in fact, the African, uh, emerging African approach is we want to leverage on emerging technologies from partnering with, uh, with international development and the private sector, but to ensure that we achieve development that meets the African needs. That is something that is really distinct from the African system that we would we want to uh, leverage on this, but to ensure that we meet, the, uh, uh, we have development that considers the African context and also meets the African needs. So uh, as I wind up, this uh, uh, the, 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 this part of the presentation that I'm making is uh, part of a wider thinking that I'm having to ground uh, my work or the, uh, to give my work a theoretical underpinning, the research that I am I'm doing. If you look at uh, uh, what uh, I, I have written there, you always find that in the mix, individuals or people are usually not involved in these projects. So somehow there, there, there have been a lot of um, uh, lack of trust, especially when people or their reports about surveillance, there have also been um, uh, human rights violations emanating from uh, the partnership arrangements. And so uh, as I wind up, my, uh, the input that I think uh, this will really uh, bring is about ensuring that the partnerships in Africa are down up. That is, they also give the individuals an opportunity to give their voice. I once participated in a program um, by uh, a, a German uh, uh, car company. They wanted to roll out an e, um, it's an e project. Let me not exp go into the details uh, of the project, but what they did first before they uh, operationalized the partnership was to do a value study just to ensure that what do what do Kenyans value? It's like, what do they value? Uh, what are we going to roll out? And how is this, is it going to align to their values? So because when you do a value study, you're able to see what are the values and what they're able to compromise and what they're not able to compromise. This data justice, I believe, uh, and it could also uh, go into all other disciplines, is really important because then it underpins the role of the people. It shows that what we are doing is not only for the profits, but also there is an out, there's a final person who is supposed to benefit and that person is the right holder and there has to be a risk-based approach to protecting their rights. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Nelson, for your presentation and and for uh, bringing to, into the table uh, or, or reminding us that um, as as uh, the pre uh, previous uh, presentation, we're um, we're um, speaking about um, global effort for uh, towards uh, sustainable development and and addressing 
um, these uh, systemic um, frameworks for assessing human rights uh, in in these uh, partnerships with so powerful actors are so so important and um also i think it's uh it's very connected with with uh the case we uh we were working with yesterday uh, alianza sire uh, and uh, and we also shared the, the importance of, of really uh working <clears throat> towards the global access to to basic services and, um, and this notion of uh, data justice i think it's it's uh, really relevant and and uh, something that we we share uh, so thank you thank you so much for your presentation and um we're going to to continue with uh, our last uh, panelist uh, uh, laura mendoza sandoval from she's a um, doctoral researcher at uh, scuola normale superiore and uh uh, she has a, a very interesting background working in Latin America with different uh, initiatives, communities, and uh, she's going to share some insights about um, agroecology in the crossroads of cooptation, tactics and strategies for the trans uh, transformation of food systems. So, uh, Laura, the floor is yours. I hope the pointer is working. If not, we are going to, yeah, great. Think the system doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very smart last panelist. Uh, so thank yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to pass it. Thank you. Thank you, Jaime. Thank you all um, the my colleagues from the from the panel and thank you all. I'm really grateful to be here as you have seen and listened and I am uh, getting a lot of insights from all of you uh, as an outsider, self-considered outsider or of this topic of partnerships and how uh, what is the research what, what is the role of research and academia uh, in like getting some insights you know, in this whole configuration of partnerships to for sustainable, transformative uh, tra transitions no like um so my in my presentation i will try to be as uh, as short as possible um i'm going to also bring not necessarily like a complete picture of my current research which is um an ethnography on the agroecology movement in the south of spain in the um, autonomous community of andalusia uh, I'm not going to to go super deep on, onto that, but I'm going to. The idea was to bring a little bit to my like my intellectual trajectory in a way um, that is informing or try to sensitize a little bit my 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 lenses um, to approach what do we mean by agro um, agro food transformation. So right now we are uh, facing uh, like a huge challenge uh, in terms of environmental, social justice. And I really want to thank Nelson to bring us to this, uh, also recognizing the historical you know, baggage in that led us here. Um, and I found it really fascinating the way that I, that I like I'm approaching and I got to this topic as an anthropologist, but also as an urban uh, scholar was through the idea of how to imagine and how to create like agroecology cities, no agroecological cities, agroecological urbanism. And this is a, a concept that is proposed by Caroline Steele, a British uh, urbanist, that she is challenging also from the language, from the concepts that we, uh, from which we, perceive and understand and imagine the world uh, is the starting point, no? So in order to challenge the utopia kind of paradigm, uh, she proposes uh, citopias, citos as the Greek uh, root of food, because food is what sustains life. It's a fuel of life. And as humans, like uh, being part of, a, of, of a, an ecosystem, there is no division, no, between nature culture. We have to overcome these dichotomies also urban, rural. So this kind of uh, perspective was really inspiring to me and also challenged um, my um, my approach to, okay, how as a researcher, but also as an urbanist, uh, as, a, as an urban scholar, how can we contribute to this configuration? No, 
And agroecology is a social movement that is rooted in uh, struggles from indigenous peasant uh, movements from Latin America, uh, mainly for from um, like pri primarily from the global south, but also there is a literature that accounts for traces the genealogy of agroecology in um, Russia. There, there's different like locations in which this uh, movement has, has has emerged, has boosted. But I'm just talking about the kind of contemporary approach to agroecology, um, which uh, tries to connect then ecological justice and social justice and how to appropriate, reappropriate our, the way that we produce, consume, distribute food. And agroecology must be in tandem with uh, food sovereignty, which is a political agenda, again, uh, led by, uh, peasant movements like La Via Campesina. And it's very important to remember always that without agroecology, food sovereignty is just a slogan. And without food sovereignty, agroecology is just a technology. So it's uh, this is very important in order to then understand what do we mean by cooptation. This is not working now. Um, so I'm just going to be very brief on that because um, it's not working. Uh, currently, also, again, the, the idea of the language, how uh, we, if you can do uh, one more, please. Um, how are we understanding transformations and transitions is also based on the language, it's based on the kind of visions that we can have, it's kind, it's based on the, the baselines, no, the, the criteria that are grounding our measurements and all the things that we have talked about. And the, there are different scenarios that are dominant and the um, market and also the more powerful entities in the global capitalist system in which we are living are the drivers of such a change, unfortunately. Um, so we have to think how do we imagine the future of globalized agri-food systems? If it's going to be an open source sustainability in which both knowledge, skills, but resources and power is distributed, or we're going more to a survival of the richest, which is basically what is happening um, right now, may, ma many might claim, uh, because uh, like the green capitalism is taking over, you know, also in the food industry. So, but the challenge is really clear. There is a deep pesantization of society, less people is living in rural side, less people is producing the food that is sustaining our lives. There's more people concentrated in urban settlements. So how are we going to face this? Um, According to the the agendas that the like more mostly are being followed by transnational organizations, also uh, states, and are like are being oriented by SDGs, like we know. Um, again, I think that is very important as researchers to approach them in a critical manner, to go really deeply to what are the paradigms that they are implementing, because if our indicators are based on that, then we have to really question and be honest to ourselves. Are we really challenging the system? I think no, because they, there's a like evident reproduction of a colonial matrix of power. We have the, still the division of developed and underdeveloped. There is this idea that someone that needs to be saved from, you know, like the North and this and also this techno technological uh, hope, no, like the techno fixes that are thinking that they um, agri-food sector needs to first produce more because we have the economic growth as the core of the motivation of uh, also sustainability and sustainable development. And also the way to do that is always like the solution that is thought is through technology. Um, so there's of course, apart from, from these uh, baselines, there is a plethora of other organizations that are um, studying, okay, how is this being really implemented? And what I mean by this is the partnerships that are right now uh, dominating the, the transition to agri-food systems. And there is a very insightful report uh, that was um, published three, three years ago from TNI and Friends, Friends of the Earth um, and other um, um, NGOs. And they clearly denote who who are the members, who are the, who are the stakeholders taking uh, the lead in the boards of these platforms, of these partnerships. Uh, the, three, the, the three partnerships that they studied, uh, 
um, indicated that 95% of the members that are on the boards are private companies like Nestlé, Danone, Unilever, which are actually the ones that we want to uh, challenge, you know, if we really talk about systemic challenges. So um, then I question, yes, you can continue, please. Uh, so this is like the 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 baseline. No, this is the the reality, the landscape in which we are operating. Yes, there is a cooptation. There's an ambiguity of agroecology because it has become a super trendy keyword as a savior of the climate uh, change because agriculture produces uh, one third of the greenhouse gas emissions. So this is a key sector in the economy in order to reduce and mitigate no the climate. Uh, um change and global warming um that needs to be to be tackled so it is a key sector in the economy it is a uh, vital for the sustaining of life it's also a flourishing knowledge and economic sector but also it's a mode of life that is counter hegemonic that it's fostering like self-determination that is fostering territorial struggles no that it's a tool that uh, is used by communities in order to change also the the philosophies that we in which we based ourselves like buen vivir svaraj eh, ubuntu like there's like a plethora of other cosmologies that are not indicated by growth economic growth green capitalism so i question the question that i want to bring here is the dominant model that we have in, of partnerships, partnerships is always public-private, and there's some level of civic uh, involvement. But how can we uh, think of the citizen involvement without, like, reproducing that tokenization? No, like, just a tick box that says, "Okay, we have someone and some representative of an abstract community." What is this community? Okay, this is a question that has been grounding for quite a while. Then the question that I bring is more, okay, which other models can we think of when we are practicing or designing different sorts of, of partnerships? Can we think about public commons partnerships, for example? I don't know if this is something that has been in the literature. You might give me some more insights on that. Um, so now just to um, finish, I think that the time is, you can continue, please. I'm just going to give you two insights the kind of theory that also, I mean, as being part of uh, the academia and trying to get to use the concepts that have been, you know, being built for ages to diagnose what is happening, but also to position ourselves and try to do something in this reality that is quite dreary. Um, you can continue, please. Um, I'm, I, I have different, like, uh, discipline backgrounds. I'm just going to talk about the intersection between social movement studies and urban political ecology in a particular like uh, theory that is a, a, a way to understand, to explain, but also politicize how the agriculture sector has had a role in the development and construction of the world capitalist economy. And, but not just to, again, not just to diagnose, but also to uh, highlight which are the moments of crisis in which social movements, grassroots initiatives, and the citizen, citizenship that is organized in a way um, can also bridge in and push for agendas that are more transformative and not like new ways or um, yeah, new makeups of uh, the same exploitation, expropriation, and capitalist accumulation. So if you can continue, the food regime theory basically has a periodization Okay, I'm, I'm going to be super fast. It has a, a historical periodization of how like the world system has been configured through agrarian capitalism. And we pass from different discourses, different types of technologies, different types of social spatial configurations from the colonial to the developmentalist uh, hegemony to right now the corporate food regime in which nations are like also kind of Make up it, there, sorry, nation states are there, but they have lost all the power. All the power is given to um because of processes of processes of neoliberalization are given to corporations. And now we have, according to the criteria to understand the junk agroecology and the cooptation of agroecology, there is three notions, three proofs or evidences to 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 say. 
um, that agroecology is being co-opted because first there is an emphasis of technology as a solution. Second, there is um, this um, the hegemony or the replacement of multilateral multilateralism, which was more into the developmentalist agenda in which nation states were in the core through in, um, international uh, cooperation, development, and these kind of agencies. And third, um, there is the, the power that is given totally because of the dissolution of the nation state as an agent of power and uh, govern, gov governance, uh, then the power is kind of distributed, but to big corporations, no? Um, so the question is, if you can continue, how, um, yeah, we can continue. This is a representation basically of how the agri-food regime works with two big concentrations of power and resources. And the idea of, from agroecology as a movement is to uh, bridge or overcome those um, uh, bottlenecks through direct, uh, like connecting producers and consumers via direct purchase schemes or alternative food networks, but also how to convert like reverse the the demographic distribution, know how to make more, uh, bring more people to produce, uh, create new ruralities, and and representize basically the society. And if we can continue, um, the case uh, you can do a lot because there's an animation. The case the, this is the place in which I am doing the ethnography, which is the south of Spain. A Europe's orchard, which basically has been like their economy is based on a vegetable extractivism, labor exploitation from migrant workers, um, and a plethora of on, on social injustices, environmental injustices. So I was think I was I did a mapping. If you can continue, maybe of the how different grassroots organizations recognized as agroecology agro agroecological could be mapped into uh, these Cartesian kind of coordinates uh, in relation of how progressive and how radical were they in terms of the um, vision that they have towards reappropriation of food um, in practice. And because the theory, the food regime theory says that um, if there's a convergence between radical and progressive, they can push for a uh, more transformative um, food regime. So I tried to test this kind of hypothesis and do an observation via ethnography, and then you can continue. Uh, but I, it's also quite simplistic. We have to be, again, really wary about, okay, these theories to be applied, it's okay, we have to take them with a grain of salt. It's not like as A plus B is C, no? Like there's a, a lot of uh, com complexities in the process. So this is how I found the multi-level perspective analysis. And I'm really grateful that uh, Miguel, yes, that Miguel talk about, about that, that. So if you can continue, because there are these three, three levels, landscape, uh, the dominant socio-technical regime and the niche innovations. And I'm not going to go further because you did it perfectly. But what I want to bring here is that the way that we can use these uh, as researchers um, in the agri-food system transformation is through identifying the specific terrains in which the niche innovations, the grassroots are competing, are disputing the power and the resources with the socio-technical um, level. So in this approach, if you can continue, uh, and yeah, there's six basically that were recognized by uh, this, this is a compendium, uh, uh, a collaborative uh, research done uh, two years ago, indicating this, uh, how to put in practice uh, this approach into agri-food system transformations. And what I did, if you can continue, uh, well, this course, the, the way that the discourse, the framing is done is either enabling or disabling a truly transformative uh, transition, no? And, but more than that, because we already know that, if, I just want to give a little bit of a input on, for example, when we talk about rights and access to land, water, seeds, and biodiversity, again, as Bruna was saying, when we tackle certain um, um, phenomena, it's not just a single thing. You find like it's an interrelated process, especially when we're talking about landscapes, when we're talking about the sustenance of life and uh, agriculture, uh, we're talking about the maintenance of livelihoods, we're talking about how also everything is distributed in the community, in the society. So, but very concretely, the, the one of the first, uh, the vital uh, 
elements in order to think and practice um, an agroecological setting or project is through land and water and biodiversity. And in Andalusia, there is a concentration of land that is, uh, it's also a historical process. Um, there is so there is an impediment to distribute this core um, and yes, 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 and the niche, the niche, some of the niche practices that are that were seen in the, and, and they're being practiced is how to overcome an ownership regime, common inclines, uh, and uh, or for example, there is uh, an interlinkage between um, different uh, terrains of transformation and um, the discourse, the discourse element. So how are we envisioning, or how the gra grassroots movements are envisioning and are shifting are challenging also the way that we the value system in which they base their practices so if you go one more they uh, this is the case of a uh, one community supported agriculture scheme in granada called ortigas they managed to translate a political statement which was the puntos violeta these uh, spaces for free of uh, gender-based violence that were introduced uh, one year ago uh, by yeah, the, the government. And they in, translated the, those spaces in which they would guarantee that their uh, parties and their events were going not to endorse any sort of violence. They translated that through ecological principles. This means that they grounded the ecological mindset because there's a change in the culture. There's a change in the way we perceive uh, as humans in part of being part of an uh, of, of nature we are not divided from it so in that the way that they put this in practice via a, a discourse was to create a ladybug in the events that they are hosting so because ladybugs they control pests in the orchards so it's again an ecological principle translated to a political statement and then we can go to the last one. I think it's two more. Yes, the last one before. Uh, there's just questions, um, just to put them there, which are like questions that I want to bring here, um, but maybe we, we can continue this informally in this conversation. Like, again, like how are we in, as researchers, what, how are we positioning ourselves towards the power and towards the dominant configuration of uh, society uh, this is a, an open question that we always have to ask ourselves, but also more concretely, how our research could be useful to weaken or dismantle the corporate food regime in my case, or other, um, uh, other power structures, uh, or how can our research uh, and foster and strengthen more um, direct democratic processes? Uh, these are the questions that I would like to kind of address. And again, how to create different models of partnerships. And if I, I was also wondering, when we talk about social movements, we cannot talk think of in silos, particularly when, when it's food. Uh, so I was thinking if there's any usability or, or if there is any pertinence of using the partnership scheme or lenses in order to imagine the convergences of different social movements because for example one of the reasons why food is in the center right now of um like the um, um like it's let's say a problem is because it's produced cheaply because it's part of the industry it's part of a capitalist system so and it's cheap and we have precarious works so how can we imagine for example an universal basic income a movement that is combining converging with agroecology movements so that it's a more systemic real change and not thinking in silos. So yeah, this is uh, my grain of salt to the round table and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Laura, and for bringing some, so many important um reflections and, and also for focusing one uh, specific topic which uh, I think it's uh, essential in, in in the general uh, sustainable transitions which are uh, agri-food systems and the importance for uh, bridging bones between rural and, and, and urban contexts 
uh, and also uh, for highlighting the agri agroecology uh, st stream or, or framework that we also have been following. We had the chance to have uh, Professor Altier here uh, some years ago. And, um, and uh, yeah, for bringing so many uh, interesting ideas and, and reflections. And uh, I would like to... Um, to start, well, if if we were supposed to uh, to finish now, I don't know if we can have fifteen more minutes because we are going to have lunch uh, after now, right? And maybe for at least for the Spaniards uh, to have lunch before uh, twelve o'clock, <laughs> we can shortcut. Uh, so maybe uh, we can have like yeah, at least yeah, fifteen minutes. So uh, I'm going to pass the baton to the to the audience. Uh, but the question that um, I had here, it, it's much related. What do you highlighted uh, at the end? The role of of uh, academy researchers as individuals, but also as institutions and uh, organizations in in partnerships and in collaboration. I think that we uh, more or less address this, but maybe not so explicitly. So well. Uh, as I have the micro is my uh, my question, but I'm going to to pass the baton to the audience. So, um, if any one of you have some, and yeah, so I'm I'm going to to pass uh, a couple of questions here in the in the room and then to the virtual audience. 